I guess we'll get started. So my name is Lee Buckler. I am Vice President of Business and Corporate Development at a cell therapy company called Replicel Life Sciences. And I am in this industry by osmosis, not by education. I am a recovering attorney. I say the mantra every morning. I um, took a, a law degree, practiced uh, after a judicial clerkship, took uh, and practiced law for three years, looked down the hall, and decided I needed something more scintillating. So I jumped over to a stem cell company, which turns out to be a lot more scintillating. Um, spent six years sort of learning the industry with a company called Stem Cell Technologies. Um, got recruited by a contract manufacturer called PCT, Progenitor Cell Therapy, did biz dev for them for two and a half years in the US. We had facilities in California and New Jersey. And then did consulting. I had my own consulting firm for six years between 2008 and 2014 um, and did a lot of uh, market intelligence, competitive intelligence, business development work for companies in or interested in the cell therapy space. And um, I often joked that I wasn't sure whether my consulting practice fed my social media habit or my social media fed my consulting practice. Um, bit, of a, bit, of a, bit of a social media nerd. Um, so for those of you who are on Twitter, I am at cell therapy. Um, um, I uh, run a LinkedIn group, which is a very valuable resource for anybody in the, um, in the industry. It's called the LinkedIn Cell Therapy Industry Group. And it's a phenomenal peer-to-peer -peer exchange of uh, ideas, information, debate, discussion, um, including a lot of these issues that we'll talk about today. You know, where does the line of compliance lie? Uh, with respect to physicians and, um, and regulators and um, a lot of patient advocates and en engaged heavily in that debate. And it's very, some very, very interesting issues. So I encourage you to, to, to check that out. And um, have a blog as well, Cell Therapy Blog. So I'm just, I have a few sort of uh, just opening uh, slides to sort of set the tone. And then we've got um, uh, some great legal advice and some great medical advice. And then we'll open the floor up for, uh, for questions or debate. Um, as we uh, as we see fit, so you know this whole field of cell therapy is an interesting <coughs> field that's defined. We're trying to define it by you know by technology, um, but even the technology represents this wide spectrum of approaches. We've got you know uh, all the different um, um, sources of our cells. Um, from um, embryos to fetal tissue to birth tissue to adults to animals that we employ, um, uh, you know, various places uh, 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 that we source uh, our cells from, from any of those, um, different kinds of, uh, of, of cell categories, different kinds of cell types, and then we use them in different ways. We throw them in the same patients, we throw them in other patients, we mix them sometimes, or we take animal cells and put them in humans um, in some instances. And we package them differently. Some are fresh, some are frozen, some are frozen then fresh, um, some are fresh then frozen, et cetera, et cetera. And so when you combine all this together, it really represents a, a, a milieu of technologies and, and, and approaches um, that we throw under one umbrella. And then there's various different ways you can package the, um, the, the business, too. There's, um, as, uh, as Shane will talk about, there's a whole category of processing devices that are largely around supporting either the biomanufacturing, bioprocessing of these cell products, or putting doctors in the business of processing cells that they can then put into patients. There's fully regulated therapeutics, which in the US we call 351s, in Europe they call ATMPs. Then there's the more nominally regulated therapeutics, which in the US are 361s, and in Europe are non-ATMPs. These are the minimally manipulated homologous use kind of products, to use FDA speak. And then there's the business of providing you know, clinical services uh, where doctors are throwing cells into patients, typically under, um, at least arguably nominally regulated, but many, there's many, 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 many clinics, even in the US, who are, uh, have arguably stepped well over this line, um, who are providing um, uh, cells to patients uh, which are neither, um, uh, either not minimally manipulated or clearly not for, for homologous use. And there's a big enforcement, um, um, you know, at least from some people's perspective, problem in the US where physicians are doing things which are clearly not compliant with the regulation and yet they're getting away with it because the FDA is either uh, disinterested or incapable of, of, main, of, of keeping up with the enforcement of the regulation as it stands today. And the number of clinics doing this kind of thing is growing 
growing exponentially. Um, but there's also a legitimate way to do this business, and that is to provide these nominally re regulated therapeutics to for, for, for purposes um, uh, which are clearly compliant with the regulation. And then, you know, from a regenerative medicine perspective, there's all kinds of ways to regenerate um, uh, the human body in, in, with acellular approaches as well. So from a regulatory perspective, um, uh, this is just a, a different schematic for the same kind of thing. You know, this all really emanated out of the practice of, 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 of medicine where we, you know, we found that we could reconstitute immune systems from a stem cell transplantation uh, by, by using a stem cell transplantation after chemotherapy. And, you know, I was involved very, very early in the debate when, you know, the FDA was creating this regulatory framework back in 2004 and 5 when, you know, there were many a doctor standing, you know, thumping their fist on the podium saying, this is the practice of medicine, stay out of it. Um, you have no business being here, um, and, um, and, and that was uh, largely a losing battle, um, uh, and we've evolved now to have the regulatory framework we have, the framework we have today. And, um, you know, Cytori and Arteriocyte and many other system companies have, um, have processing devices. There are certain uh, 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 products which have been grandfathered in, uh, approved in, under different regulatory, in the absence of, of the regulations we have today. And other products, you know, it's not just doctors that, that run afoul of, of the current regulatory framework. There are many a company who bring products to market which are, um, um, you know, very arguably not homologous, um, very arguably not minimally manipulated, and yet they're out on the, on the, in, in the marketplace selling these products with just waiting for the FDA to catch up to them or not, as the case may be, and make a bucket of money in the meantime. Um, then there's, you know, fr uh, from a different perspective, you know, the different, I call it the platform view or the mechanism view. Um, you know, we used to think... Um, you know, again, autologous, allogeneic, et cetera. But we used to think all of cell therapies was really about permanent engraftment, where we put cells in, they stay there, they do what we want them to do. And, you know, largely, I think most of cell therapy has migrated away from this permanent engraftment sort of perspective and, you know, um, believes that the effect is, um, is, is much more transient in nature. There are, of course, a number of, of cell therapies commercially available in the U.S., and this proves my original point. The ones in, uh, in the dark uh, uh, font are ones that have overt regulatory approval uh, in the U.S., and the ones which are in gray are, are products which at least the company alleges are 361 products. Of course, the companies don't have to get an opinion uh, from the FDA uh, that that's true, they can just go straight to market claiming that it's a 361, and in the absence of enforcement otherwise, uh, they are marketing their products. Um, some of these are clearly compliant and some of them are questionable. And the same is true in Europe, uh, and the same is true uh, elsewhere as well. well this is uh, just a list of some of the products uh, that are uh, uh, regulatory approved in other places outside of Europe uh, or, um, or the U.S. So what we have, you know, I think what's interesting and perhaps was one of the um, uh, impetus for this uh, session is we have, I think, you know, an incredible market pull to deliver cells to patients. Patients are learning more and more about the power of stem cells, the power of cell therapy. They're running out of options in terms of, of traditional medical approaches. And they're going to their doctors and saying, look, I've got a friend who went to the Dominican or a friend who went to China or a friend who went to Mexico or I just read an article in Scientific America or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I want stem cells. And if you don't give them to me or someone give them to me in my hometown, I'm going to travel to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico or somewhere like this and get them. And so there's a patient pull. There's also, uh, you know, this is the practice of medicine is largely in the U.S. a business. And so, you know, there is a, there is a, a pressure. You know, a lot of orthopedic surgeons, a lot of plastic surgeons, uh, you know, to name, uh, you know, a couple of, uh, of I think, practices where uh, this is really growing exponentially, uh, want to be the first physician in town, uh, the first game in town that is delivering a new novel type of cell-based therapy to their patients. Um, um, and, and, and oftentimes it's, it stays within their specialty, within their practice. But in other instances, we have plastic surgeons, um, you know, giving adipose stem cells to treat, you know, autism um, right here within the borders of the United States of America, um, let alone in other countries. And so, um, you know, it, it becomes uh, very uh, increasingly questionable. 
This is a schematic of some of the many, many, many um, cell processing devices that are available out there for physicians to use. These are not, for the most part, devices which are um, uh, tied to any therapeutic claims, and yet most of them are available for physicians or clinics to purchase and use as they see fit um, to process cells, to, de to deliver cells to patients. Um, you know, one of the other things I think that's happening um, here in real time is the use of cells for all kinds of other purposes as well. And this adds to the exponential learning curve and, and knowledge base of, of cells. So, you know, certainly, as I said, we're using them in clinical service. We're using them as, as, as cell therapies, but we're also increasingly exploring the use of cells in consumer goods for everything from the creation of, you know, biological uh, um, um, equivalent um, leather to meat to bio toys to DIY kits um, to, uh, you know, uh, education kits, etc. We're exploring the use of cells in 3D printing um, applications to not only for drug testing, but also for, you know, uh, other kinds of applications. And, you know, uh, in keeping with, uh, with, uh, with what has been true in the, in the past, anything that can be weaponized will be weaponized or used for defense purposes as well. So, you know, what's interesting, I think, is that we are, you know, on the one hand, especially if you're doing autologous cell therapy, it's arguable that these, that autologous cell therapy has a, has a very high safety profile. And this is a lot of the physicians that are doing, um, you know, adventurous things in the U.S. will put this up to their patients and say, well, you know, at the worst case, these, this is benign, right? This, this will do no harm. These are your cells. We're just putting them back to you. But the, the expectation here is that we're doing something that we've never done before. We're not just treating, you know, first or second order symptoms. We're, 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 and we're not, you know, doing modifying disease. We're arguably trying to correct uh, defects or regenerate tissue. And this is expecting something of the therapeutic that, that's not been done before. And um, we may or may not accomplish that. Um, you know, I think the jury's still out. I you know, believe that cells will, will prove to be capable of this. Um, uh, but, but certainly, we're stepping the game up in terms of what we expect of these kinds of therapies. So, um, you know, one of the other phenomena, I think, is that, you know, there's a very large public and, 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 and industry uh, expectation that cells will represent a paradigm shift of, of, of healthcare uh, in the future. I don't believe it's going to be an overnight revolution. I think it's going to be a, a, a slow, perhaps painfully slow evolution as we learn how to employ cells therapeutically. I believe that will happen. Um, I like to believe that data will drive all of this, um, and in certain circumstances, I think it will. And yet, we're seeing um, a lot of physicians race ahead of data. In, in employing the practice of cells into the practice before there's real data to justify that. And that's understandable on one, on one hand because you see patients you know, demanding a therapeutic, they're without options, these are perceived to have a high safety profile, and yet, you know, to the extent that you're charging patients and, and, and marketing these therapeutics ahead of what the data will support, it's also, I think, um, in many minds, in many minds um, a, a questionable practice. And so, you know, it, you get into this interesting, um, you know, quagmire where you have people who, you know, believe ardently in alternative medicines and natural medicines and the power of the human body to repair itself. And so you start to, you know, to, to, to cross the line between pure scientific fact and data-driven medicine into, you know, these ideas and concepts of, of tradition and faith and culture and, and even human rights, which enters a lot into the, FDA, to the debate about whether the FDA has a right to, to regulate the therapeutic use of your own cells. And patients, believe me, get very passionate about that, about that position. So I think this is my last slide. You know, the, the title of this session is Clinician's Guide to Avoiding Compliance Issues. Um, and there are ways, there are different ways to avoid compliance issues. One is just to fly under the radar and try and avoid enforcement. Um, you know, the short answer is you should understand the regulations, understand them well, and act only within the parameters of the regulations. Um, but of course, uh, you know, avoiding compliance issues, um, you know, may mean just not getting caught to you um, as a physician, and that's that's different. Of course, uh, you know, not agreeing with the law, as we've seen in recent case law, uh, is not a defense, nor is ignorance a defense. Um, saying I'm a doctor, trust me, is not a defense. Um, and um, and 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 what's also interesting, a lot of 
a lot of, you see a lot of companies and physicians say, well, uh, the FDA hasn't knocked on my door, so uh, I guess it's legal, right? And that's not true. It just means they haven't knocked on your door yet. Um, they haven't been there today. They may come tomorrow. And yet there, there's no inference of compliance simply by lack of enforcement. Um, but sometimes, um, you know, if you look at this purely from a business perspective, purely on a cost-benefit analysis, and you ask yourself, as long as I don't do anything harmful to patients, what's the FDA really going to do? They're going to issue you a letter and say, stop it. So you stop it. In the meantime, you've developed a practice, you've made some money, you've treated some people, maybe even helped some people. Um, and so, you know, some people have the philosophy that I'm just going to go ahead and do it, and it's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, um, certainly a lot less expensive, and so I'm just going to do it uh, um, in, and, and act in the best, and I don't mean to say that this is purely commercial or crass, it's, they, they, doctors oftentimes take this attitude uh, in purely in the best interest of doing what they can for their patients. So I think you have to pick your strategy. Some companies are saying, look, this is a gold rush, I'm going to get in there, market my product, make as much money as I can, and when I get the 483 letter, I'll stop. Um, um, some, uh, uh, you know, and so some try to fly under the radar and evade enforcement. Um, others try and uh, avoid compliance issues. But if you really want to build a, a big practice or a big, uh, you know, sell a lot of product and market this extensively, you will at some point raise the red flag and you can expect um, um, to be treated, uh, you know, to, 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 to get the appropriate attention from the regulators. And the other question I think physicians have to ask themselves is, is, is there a duty beyond treating your patients? Is there a duty as a physician in a, in a tr using avant-garde um, therapeutics like this to contribute to the clinical science, to the body of clinical science while treating your patients? Um, and, and I think many, many physicians would argue that there is. So um, with that said, um, I, I think we will save the questions until the end, and I'll introduce um, our physician, uh, Shane. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Lee. Um, while uh, I wait to bring my slides up here, my name is uh, Shane Shapiro. I'm a physician at Mayo Clinic. I practice in Jacksonville, Florida. I am the clinician in the clinician's perspective to uh, perspective of uh, FDA compliance. Uh, I'm here because um, I have uh, a clinical trial in which uh, we obtained uh, an IND from the FDA. So I have successfully navigated uh, the gauntlet, so to speak, in terms of um, uh, bringing our study uh, to, to our patients. We are studying the use of bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells in patients with knee osteoarthritis. And so this is a uh, first of its kind in, uh, in that it is randomized, it's blinded, and it is placebo controlled. So uh, a lot of those, um, a lot of the issues that come up uh, uh, during uh, the course of, uh, of, of Lee's discussion, Lee's introduction, we've, um, we've experienced those already, and so I think I can offer some perspective. Uh, I've got about uh, uh, 10 minutes worth of my perspective uh, to give you, and then, uh, and then we'll talk about some of the other uh, labeling uh, issues, and, uh, and then we'll open up to questions. So here's the human regenerative uh, map as, uh, as uh, clinicians view it, in that we've always had uh, the opportunity for self-healing. The last 50 years or so, especially in the world of orthopedics, and sports medicine, we've, uh, we've replaced things when they're broken or torn, ligament reconstruction, joint replacement, so on and so forth. And then the next generation of therapy, as Lee introduced, uh, is uh, regeneration. So uh, everybody's aware of the type of cells that we're talking about and uh, why we are um, uh, required to, to regulate these. Uh, I won't belabor that point. Uh, we know, of course, about the limitations of embryonic stem cells and their uh, ethical considerations as well as their uh, difficulty in use. And therefore, for that reason, we, have, uh, we dive into uh, these other uh, cellular treatments. And uh, Lee mentioned a, a bunch of different cell therapies. My focus uh, really is on the stem cell. And, um, and, uh, and so I'll have something to say about that in, in a short bit. But these are uh, the main uh, sources of stem cell that we're seeing uh, in clinical practice and in uh, and the research environment today. 
So um, the Food and Drug Administration established in 1938 as part of the uh, Interstate Commerce Act and then specifically the division within the FDA is the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research or CBER and uh, Lee already mentioned the, uh, uh, the code that defines human cells, tissues and cellular uh, tissue based products. So 361 of the Public Health Services Act is the, um, uh, is the section that regulates the use of uh, homologous and minimally manipulated cells. So in order to, um, uh, to reach that classification, you have, to, um, you, you have to meet a couple of stipulations. Why uh, is the FDA regulating what we do? Uh, again, we mentioned practice of medicine, but in reality, someone needs to watch over that we have good donor eligibility. Someone needs to watch over that we have good tissue practices. Someone needs to make sure that we are preventing contamination, that we are preventing the, the spread of disease. And it's for that reason that we must register all these products uh, with CBER. Uh, and so under 361, minimal manipulation, homologous use, and then not combined with any other regulated substances or drugs. So essentially the only thing it can be combined with uh, is water or saline or, or something of that sort. So uh, examples of those uh, tissues uh, include just about any human tissue that you can think of. They're actually, it would probably have been smarter to list the, the, the exceptions uh, rather than the actual examples. Uh, but as you can see, uh, the, this practice then touches almost every aspect of medicine. And so, um, as, as I mentioned, we need to have minimal manipulation. That means for um, structural characteristics and biological characteristics of the tissues cannot be manipulated in any way, uh, shape, or form. The exact definitions uh, can be found uh, on the FDA's uh, website. So, so here's how I got involved. We thought we had, um, as Lee mentioned, uh, within the scope of the practice of medicine, we are doing bone marrow aspirations. Uh, we are filtering the bone marrow in the same room that we aspirate the bone marrow. We're then um, uh, processing that bone marrow with an FDA approved medical device, which is essentially just a centrifuge. And then once uh, we spin down uh, the product into its concentrated form, the, the, the MSCs are then injected back into the patient's knee and done so in a randomized uh, blinded placebo controlled trial. So um, we, th we thought we had homologous use, we thought we had minimal manipulation, and it was the FDA's opinion that what we were doing was uh, either not homologous or more than min minimal manipulation, so that we were not covered under Section 361 of the Public Health Services Act, and therefore we required uh, an investigational new drug application in order to proceed with our study. Presumably, if you have an actual product, once you uh, complete that IND, you may then apply for an approved biological license. So um, despite the fact that we are not culturing, uh, we still have an IND. I, I suspect that in uh, the second phase or third phases of our trial, we hope to use these cells in uh, greater numbers. Perhaps more is better. We don't really know whether or not that is uh, the case. Uh, but uh, in any case, that is what uh, the FDA requires of us in order to proceed forth with what we believe are medical procedures. Uh, as Lee mentioned, if you fail to comply with these reg regulations, you may receive one of the following uh, four letters from the FDA as uh, a company called Regenerative Sciences uh, uh, experienced uh, quite recently when their medical practice, which uh, used culture expanded mesenchymal stem cells for uh, musculoskeletal ailments, uh, was shut down uh, based on the fact that they did not comply with these with these regulations. So. Um, that's sort of the clinician's perspective. Now on the other side of the coin, what is the FDA's perspective? Well, as of January of 2014, there were no uh, biologic license applications for MSC products 
that have been awarded by the FDA. So if there's anyone else in the audience that knows of such a product or if something's come about since January, uh, feel free to correct me. But to my knowledge, uh, nothing awarded for true MSC product. Now, uh, the FDA's uh, surveillance of those IND applications has shown a threefold increase in the number of applications for an MSC-based product. Only 246 clinical trials worldwide, though, and if you actually think about it, for the number of medical conditions that are represented here at this conference and the number of different uh, manufacturers and industries, 246 clinical trials registered uh, for MSC-based products is actually quite a small number. And so if you think about it, I think a lot, of, uh, a lot of practitioners have decided to fly under the radar a little bit and just consider this the practice of medicine rather than uh, proceed forth and comply with the regulations. The FDA has also lamented the poor uh, nomenclature when it comes to describing MSCs. Okay, so uh, in 2006, the uh, International Society of Cell uh, Therapy proposed a set of criteria, but scientifically that's been shown since 2006 uh, that the validity is in question when it comes to a number of uh, these markers. And so uh, the FDA is evaluating all of these IND submissions for consistency in their classification of what is actually an MSC. So you might say uh, that you have a mesenchymal stem cell product when in fact the FDA does not look at this as being the case. Uh, the FDA has asked that uh, we start to consistently define what is, uh, what is truly an MSC, and so we've got the top seven markers. These are the top seven markers that appear in uh, those IND submissions. There's a number of other markers submitted. I've seen a number of them at this conference already that, are, uh, that the FDA does not consider to truly be uh, a marker of a, a mesenchymal stem cell. So what do we have to do with all of this? We've got to move uh, from the lab into uh, the clinical practice. We need good translational studies. Uh, we have to develop standard operating procedures, uh, looking at uh, all of these factors that are so important to advancing the science. We do have to go through the IND approval process if we ever hope to have uh, a medical treatment or a clinical grade product that we can roll out to the masses. At the very least, in terms of my clinical practice, and I'm looking at treating sports injuries and osteoarthritis, which millions of people suffer from, there's no way I'm going to be able to help enough people with a, uh, w with a procedure that can only be done under the radar. And, uh, and so finally, uh, Lee touched on this, and we can open this up to discussion uh, at the very end. Do we own our own cells? Is uh, autologous mesenchymal stem cell use, is that, is that actually a drug? Am I a drug manufacturer when I perform this medical procedure in uh, our uh, procedure room or in the operating room? Um, is a, a stem cell that is removed from the patient's body, remains in the same room, and not manipulated in any way, shape, or, or form, is that, a, is that a drug as classified by the FDA, or is it pra uh, the practice of medicine, as uh, uh, the Regenerative Sciences Group argued uh, last year? So uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to our legal representation for the afternoon, and then we'll have discussion afterwards. Thank you, Shane. Uh, while my slides come up, I would just like to say that uh, I am both an attorney and a biologist. And uh, I would also say that uh, I'm not here to provide each of you individual legal services. Uh, I have not, you've not hired me. I'm not doing this to, to, to gain clients. I'm here to provide some just basic information. And before I begin, I also would like to just point out two very basic things we all need to keep in mind. Despite the fact that many of us view the Food and Drug Administration as creating barriers and hurdles to advancing science by the way in which they regulate products, we have to remember that they have two very important missions. One of those is to ensure that individuals who are going to get investigational products aren't exposed to unwarranted risks. So that human subjects that get things that haven't been proven yet aren't going to be exposed to something that's going to inherently do them harm, or that they don't understand the risks. So that's one of their roles, and it's a very important role. And the second 
second role is to ensure that the products that are brought to the marketplace are safe and effective for their intended uses, and valid scientific information supports that. So the regulations are out there not to be a hindrance, but actually to protect the public health. Not always influenced in a proper way, not always exercised in an efficient way, but they're there for a very important reason. And as frustrated as we can get, we need to understand those reasons are valid and important. The last thing I would like to point out is that as a regulatory professional, it's not our job, people like me and people in the ad agency who are in the regulatory field, to tell the clinicians what you can't do. It's our job to tell you what you need to know to gather the right information, to keep the right documentation, to think about what you're doing, to understand what the product is so that you know what the regulations are. So from that perspective, one of the things I'd like to cover today is how did I get here and why do the regulators care about what I'm saying about these cellular products that I'm developing? So under the U.S. Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, the FDCA, and also the Public Health Service Act that Shane mentioned earlier, FDA has jurisdiction over labeling for prescription drugs, biologics, that includes the human cells and stem cell products. So H361 HCTPs are biologics. They're minimally regulated biologics, but they are biologics. And more than minimally manipulated or non-homologous use stem cell products are also biologics, but they're regulated under a different section, Section 351 of the Public Health Service Act. And FDA has jurisdiction over the labeling for those products as well as, as medical devices. So the processing equipment are also, their labeling is also regulated by FDA. The Federal Trade Commission has primary jurisdiction over advertising. So not labeling, but how you promote products. And FDA does not have statutory authority to regulate advertising except for restricted medical devices, a specific category, and for prescription drugs. That said, restricted device advertisement may not be false or misleading in any particular. Now, FDA and the courts have taken very broad interpretation of what, it con what constitutes labeling in determining FDA's regulatory authority. You would think it would be pretty simple. If a label is on a product, it's a label. If a package insert is shipped with a product, it's labeling. And what you put in an advertisement or you say on the internet or you put in a brochure or put in a magazine is advertising. But it's not that simple. Ads often are and frequently are considered labeling, especially if FDA believes that the advertising changes the product's intended use or educates physicians about a specific way to use a product to achieve a specific intended purpose. So what you say in an advertisement can be labeling if it tells somebody how to use your product, or more importantly, how to use your product for something new. Now, a label means any display of written, printed, or graphic matter on the immediate container. How do you label a tube with cells? How do you label a blood bag that has uh, a patient's own particular products? Um, what you put on that product depends on how you're storing it and what regulatory classification it falls under. Um, so this is why it's important to understand what a label is and what labeling is. Now, most importantly, labeling includes all written, printed, or graphic matter accompanying an article at any time while such article is in interstate commerce. And the Supreme Court, way back in 1948, held that accompanying doesn't mean it has to be shipped with it. It needs to be made available to the person who's using the product at any time he has the product in his hands to help him understand how it's supposed to be used. It could be shipped a week later, it could be available on the internet, it could arrive because he requests it or she requests it. If it's information that explains its use, the courts have said that's enough to say that it's accompanying the article because it allows you to understand how to use it. And the courts in that particular time said they could not interpret what Congress really meant, but they had to make sure that they would not frustrate the purposes of the act in making sure that only safe products were available. So labeling includes a lot of different things. It includes letters that you send to your customers. It includes videotapes. It includes trade shows. It includes training materials. If you have a patient go on a nationally syndicated television show and talk about your product and then send somebody a link to that video on YouTube, that can be labeling if it explains how your product is supposed to be used. Now, FDA jurisdiction over advertising is limited to prescription drugs and restricted devices, as I mentioned. But they often interpret 
what you've said in an advertisement to be labeling under the, the, under the process we just described. Now, having said that, there are some general rules you need to keep in mind. Labeling or advertising is false or a, a product is misbranded. That means you've said something inappropriate about it. If the labeling or advertising is false or misleading, that includes the omission of material facts about the uses that you're suggesting in your advertising or labeling. L if it lacks adequate directions for use, if the advertising omits information concerning side effects, contraindications, or effectiveness, or if it creates an unapproved new use, because unapproved new uses are themselves actually adulterated. So if your labeling creates a new use, you've both adulterated your product and misbranded it by what you've said. So FDA, what are the common rules? What are the things you have to know to be able to promote your product? Well, FDA regulated products may be labeled and advertised only for cleared or approved or licensed intended uses. Company generated labeling may not promote a product for an uncleared or unapproved use. And if a company promotes a product that lacks clearance or approval for any indication, or if its labeling or advertising creates a new intended use that requires FDA approval, the product can be considered by FDA adulterated and misbranded. So in Shane's case, whenever he was taking a medical device, a cleared, legally marketed medical device, to process cells out of the patient's own body and put them back into their own body, FDA's argument was that either he was using them for something that was significantly different from what they did in the donor, that's the homologous use argument, or that the way in which they were being centrifuged and prepared changed their relevant characteristics enough so that they were no longer just cells, they were something new. And because they were something new, he had to get FDA approval to study those products, and he also had to get FDA's eventual approval to market those products. Because a product is adulterated when it lacks an approved investigational use or pre-market approval. So to study it, he had to get an IND, and to market it, he'll have to get a BLA. And a product is misbranded if the labeling is false or misleading in any, particularly, in any particular. And what's most interesting here is that a product may be misbranded by its manufacturer, the person who makes it, or by any third party who promotes it for an off-label use. So that cleared cell processing equipment that he had to make PRP, because he was using it to make something other than PRP, F and if he were promoting it for that use, FDA could say that he had created a new use that misbranded and adulterated that processing equipment. That's one of the pathways by which they get jurisdiction over these particular processes. <clears throat> we talked about misbranding already, and this, I think, is available in the presentation material, so you'll have this. I'm not going to belabor it much longer. The bottom line is that all labeling and advertising can fall within FDA's broad jurisdictional authority and should be carefully reviewed for FDA compliance, and F uh, compliance with requirements. And how FDA interprets intended use from the regulations is very broad, and it comes from what is your objective intent? What is it that you're trying to accomplish by what you say? And what are the circumstances in which you say it? So if you're talking about your own product or someone else's product with the intent of convincing a patient that you can use it to treat them in the practice of medicine, then the circumstances and your objective intent, as determined by what you said and who you said it to them, is likely going to be viewed by FDA as the practice of medicine and non-promotional speech. You're practicing medicine. But if you're at a large conference like this, and you're talking about using a piece of equipment or your process to get people to buy your pieces of equipment or your process, then FDA, from the circumstances and the intent, from the total surrounding circumstances are likely to conclude that you're promoting your product for a new use. And it's, it's a fine distinction, and it's how clinicians sometimes can say they're flying under the radar. But it is an extremely important distinction because FDA gets to interpret from their perspective what your objective intent is. They're not going to come and ask you, well, what did you mean when you said that? They're going to come to you and say, from what I heard you say and where I heard you say it, I concluded that your objective intent was X. And if that's an inappropriate intended use, they can give you the warning letter. They can send you the untitled letter. They can seize your product. They can enjoin you from selling that particular material. If you're a foreign company, they can put an import detention that keeps it from coming into the United States simply by saying that they believe it's violative. They don't have to prove it. They just have to say they believe it's violative. And if they think you're doing it on purpose and knowingly and you're breaking the law, they can issue civil money penalties and they can even take um, criminal action against you. 
So they have a very, very broad way of reaching out into this area. And it all comes down to understanding what they believe you to be trying to say and the circumstances in which you're saying it. The example I like to give there is that if I have a biliary stent that is designed to hold a certain part of the body open and I'm only selling it to cardiovascular surgeons, my objective intent can be determined by the fact that I'm only selling it to cardiovascular surgeons, that I'm selling it for an off-label use as an example, a hypothetical example. Both FDA and FTC also require that you have substantiation for what it is that you're saying in the labeling and materials that you have. It, they can consider a claim false or misleading if the speaker lacks substantiating data or information supporting what he has said. And that includes both comparative, oops, sorry, comparative claims and superiority claims. So if you say my particular process or product is better than somebody else's, that comparative claim or superiority claim has to be substantiated with adequate data. And FDA says because otherwise it's inherently misleading. So even if you're comparing your product to an earlier version of your own product, you have to have the data available to support what you're saying, or both FDA and FTC can say that what you're saying is misleading. And if you're false or misleading in any particular in your labeling, you've misbranded your product. And comparative claims typically may be acceptable if they're based on head-to-head. -head. I'm going to get used to this thing yet. Head-to-head -head testing with the competitive product. But they both have to be approved uses for the product or investigational uses for the product. You can't have a product that's approved for X and you're comparing it to your product for use Y because nobody knows whether or not either product works for those purposes. Uh, you also can't use testimonials. Like I said, if it, somebody says your product is the greatest thing since sliced bread and you make it available on your website or you release that information or you provide a video of that particular meeting, you're talking about your product. Their speech becomes yours. So FDA also holds firms responsible for everything that's on their website. Um, links to your site um, can lead FDA to issue warning letters if the other sites that you're linking to are promoting your products for unapproved uses. And FDA frequently actually goes out and peruses people's websites to see what they're saying about their product. This is also important for products that are available both outside and inside the United States. Because FDA says that if you have a website, a single website, and you talk about both US and OUS uses, and the OUS use isn't approved in the United States, you're promoting a product for unapproved use. But they will allow you to create a bifurcated website which lets customers say, I'm coming to you from the United States or I'm coming to you from Europe. And it doesn't require that it actually confirms that you know where they were coming from, but it requires them to at least make the effort of reaching out and saying, this is where I'm from. And they find that to be, uh, usually, typically, they find that to be sufficient. So uh, it's advisable to have a policy to review information that's posted on your website. You should consider what you're talking about and how it's being talked about. You should obtain regulatory oversight for the information that's put out there. And you should apply these same pr principles also if your company has a social media site. What's said on your, your uh, Facebook page or on Twitter also could misbrand and adulterate your product, especially if you forward it or make it available. Press releases can be promotional issues. Financial documents also can be, although FDA generally takes a hands-off approach. If you're required to say something under SEC rules, FDA can't say you shouldn't have said it. Uh, physician training programs and materials can be labeling because they're teaching people how to use your product. Now, this practice of medicine issue has come up. Everyone knows that physicians may, with certain limitations, use a product in the treatment of a patient. In, in fact, for medical devices, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act specifically creates a section that says nothing in this act should be construed as limiting a physician's ability to treat his patients. And for drugs and biologics, although there's no statutory definition, there's FDA practice that basically says that if you're a physician and you're using a legally marketed product, you can use it however you see fit to treat your patients as long as you're doing so as part of treating that patient and you understand that the liability is yours. Under your state licensing requirements, under your uh, medical malpractice requirements, if you're treating that patient, you can use a legally marketed product to do that. 
Now, the key word there is legally marketed product. In the regenerative sciences case that was just talked about, the FDA and the courts have held that the practice of medicine does not involve the creation of a new product or the use of a, uh, if, if, we use the example of uh, the matrices we've been talking about today. If I take a demineralized bone matrix that's commercially available, and I take the patient's blood and I mix them together, I'm arguably practicing medicine. But if I go out and find a new way to create a new matrix, and I create it myself, and I find a new way to get a specific subcomponent, a specific growth factor out of their blood, and I develop a new technique to mix them together at just the right ratio to get the growth that I want, FDA's argument is that you're not using legally marketed products. You've created a new matrix, or you've created a new product. So autologous therapies include routine operations in which cells, tissues, and other substances are taken from and returned to the same patient in the course of a medical procedure. This includes everything from directed pre-surgery blood donation. I've given my own blood to get it back later. Clearly not the same surgical procedure. It happened maybe weeks apart. But that's an autologous therapy that FDA allows because blood products are licensed for those uses. They're legally available for those uses. It could also include the autologous fat transfer for aesthetic purposes. Same surgical procedure, it's taken out, it's put back in, it's not manipulated. It in includes skin grafts for burns. So you take skin from the bottom of the leg, you put it on the chest where you have a burn. It also includes autologous platelets for hemostasis, apheresis platelets. They're also stored for up to five days before they're used, so it doesn't have to be in the same surgical procedure. It includes platelet-rich plasma for orthopedic procedures. I take platelet PRP out with a cleared medical device, I mix it with bone grafting material, I put it back in the body. FDA says that's an autologous therapy. The therapy itself is not regulated, the medical equipment is. It can include bone marrow aspirated out of the hip and put back into the same patient. But what they've made clear in the regenerative science case, that autologous therapies are not automatically exempt from FDA regulation. If you manipulate the cells for a specific purpose, if you select the bone grafting material in a certain way, if you test it and dilute it to optimize the growth factor ratios to achieve a specific benefit, they're going to argue that it's either more than minimally manipulated, or it's not intended for homologous use, or that you've created a new product, or that you've mixed things together, like mixing acellular dermis with bone or mixing stem cells that are processed separately from bone. Their argument has historically been in their untitled letters and warning letters that you created a new product that can be regulated. And that means that there can be significant pre- and post-market regulatory oversight. And FDA has defined more clearly what they mean by same surgical procedure in a very recent guidance document. In that October 2014 guidance document, they said that same surgical procedure, autologous cells, in a single place, they're not shipped, they're not stored, probably not going to be subject to regulation unless you've more than minimally manipulated the cells or you're intending them for a non-homologous use. So the same arguments that Shane has been talking about. And that, ladies and gentlemen, summarizes the regulatory aspects of why FDA comes to you and says, what are you doing and what are you trying to accomplish? And with that, I'll turn it back over to Lee. So um, welcome you to uh, stand up at the mic and ask any questions. And while you get warmed up, um, I will ask Shane a question. So you know, I spoke uh, a little bit about this phenomena of, 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 of these, of, of, of the, I think, from my perspective, at least a plethora of clinics popping up. Um, you know, there's lots of physicians in the US treating osteoarthritis or other kinds of orthopedic conditions, cartilage, tendon, you know, arthritic kind of conditions, using a device, a fat, you know, device, PRP device, um, and throwing them into patients without going to all the effort that you've done, investing a lot of your own time, your own institutional money, maybe your own personal money, pursuing this clinical trial. I mean, what's your, what's your take on sort of the, com uh, the, the, clinical, you know, the, the, the commercial competition that that represents or the, 
or the, um, the the potential risks that represents, you know, as a as a clinician and uh, and as someone who you know wants to invest in this in in bringing this as a as a practice to your patients. So of course that's an excellent question, and um, I, I think there's two parts to that. Uh, the first part is um, of course the practice of medicine, which we've now discussed on a number of occasions, and and I have no objection with the the practice of medicine, and in fact. Uh, surgical innovation, surgical innovation for years has proceeded this way. You have some uh, a scientist, a physician with a unique idea, a unique way to treat patients. Uh, they try it out, uh, they test it, they hone it, they perfect it, and then they release it to uh, to the world, so to speak, for for others uh, to do the same. And so, uh, in some respects. Um, what you're talking about with the the small clinics, the small uh, the the small companies proceeding that way, I I honestly think there's a role for that. Um, uh, on, on the other hand, I I think that a lot of times that can be misleading, especially if uh, if the practitioners are not in it just to innovate, but are in it to, as you said earlier, make as much money as you can uh, while you can. And in, in those cases, I think it's a, uh, it's a public education uh, problem because, as you mentioned, people do show up at your front door. People show up at your clinic and they hear, they hear that you've got the stem cells or you've advertised that, that you have the stem cells and all they know is that their knee hurts and their doctor has told them they're bone on bone and their problem is they've, uh, they've got no cartilage in their knee and their surgeon said now they need metal and plastic, now they need a knee replacement and ooh, I don't want one of those dirty knee replacement things. Therefore, I must use these stem cells to regrow cartilage in my knee. And what I have found in our study uh, is that we try, uh, because it is a clinical research trial, and we try and have a very long discussion with patients over exactly what it is that we are doing, what we can do, what we don't know whether or not we can do, and try and make sure that those people are as educated as they possibly can be before choosing to undergo a particular procedure. And what we find, unfortunately, is a lot of times, you know, uh, they just want those stem cells. And it's very hard when you have a, uh, you have a procedure where you don't know all the science and, um, and patients don't really care what you're going to do. Uh, in those particular cases, I think it's, uh, I think it's very hard. And for those uh, practices that will advertise a particular procedure that they really don't know everything about, just like the FDA has said, hey, you're not, that's not really an MSC that you're using. So you're telling someone that you have stem cells when you're not counting your stem cells, or you're not characterizing your stem cells, and you may not even actually be having stem cells. So sort of a roundabout answer uh, to, you know, which is to say surgical innervation is necessary, uh, but public education is necessary also. And so I'm, I guess, on the side of I'll do my homework. Uh, the FDA will do their homework so that we can present what we know about these products and hopefully help educate uh, the public so that when they do knock on the door of the guy down the street who has the stem cells, they'll at least know what they're getting into. Yeah. Dr. Shapiro, um, I was wondering if part of your study includes um, an examination of what happens to the injected cells afterwards. There's a, one of the, Laviv is one of the approved products, and I know that, you know, it was an advisory committee meeting that um, really became, it became a real issue because um, even though from medical practice they had no reason to think that there was any migration, um, FDA sent them back to do a study to examine um, what happened to the cells. I'm curious if that's built in and if there was discussions with FDA about that. So to, so to answer your question, yes, it is. Uh, we have a number, uh, you know, I, I breezed through uh, most parts of my study uh, in the interest of brevity, um, but uh, we have a number of different variables that we're looking at in our study, uh, the first of which is safety. Um, uh, that's the, our primary endpoint, and that's the, the first thing that the FDA wants to see. Uh, our second is uh, um, quality of life and, and pain indicators. And, and of course, that's what the patient cares about. But then we're also doing synovial fluid analysis. 
So we are uh, aspirating synovial fluid before the cells are injected, one week after the cells are injected, and then six months after the cells are injected. Uh, we're analyzing those for markers of osteoarthritis. Um, we, we are characterizing all of our cells before we concentrate them. We're characterizing them after we concentrate them. Uh, we uh, are using uh, markers that we feel have been validated in a, in a fashion that the FDA has uh, requested. Um, we are also using imaging studies. So we're x-raying pre and post uh, injection, and we're also MRIing knees pre and post injection, and we're using a quantitative software to map cartilage. Now, all of these things are probably well over and above what's actually needed for this first phase of our study, because in reality, the FDA just wants us to show uh, safety, and we're not culturing cells, so in all likelihood, we don't actually believe we're going to see much dramatic change in those, in those MRIs. But we're trying to set ourselves up for future phase of study, set ourselves up to culture, um, and, and so that we'll have all these things in place, we'll know how to use them when the time comes. Uh, that, that was our plan. And then, of course, once you get into um, the, the regulatory aspects of it, the FDA required several other things of us as well, which include analysis of uh, blood counts, electrolytes, liver function tests, kidney function. We've had to throw all of these things in on the front end in order to get our IND to proceed. Is that that? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, my name is Miguel Mudor. Um, I'm uh, well, I'm seeing one of the main concerns on the field is uh, several clinics are registering uh, clinical trials on clinicaltrials.gov uh, in order to claim that they have an approved clinical trial and they use it to leverage credibility to their therapies. But they actually don't intend to go until the end with the clinical trial uh, for, for the uh, drugs. There also the concern that FDA don't have the resources to actually uh, check if everyone is complying. Do you think that these cases can actually jeopardize the, the field and create bad publicity for actually good therapies and in the future maybe you will see people not wanting to take uh, cell therapy because of bad cases that start to happening eventually because of this? Well, you know, anything's possible, and, and of course, whenever there's whenever there's rules, there's people who want to bend the rules. Um, it's inevitable. You know, one of the things we're seeing, and I think this is, you know, maybe one of the things you're referring to is um, there's there's many centers or clinics now, you know, even in the U.S. and also outside the U.S. who. Um, uh, because patients are starting to get educated to some extent about the fact that you know maybe we only should be buying a product that's in clinical buying you know buying a product that's in clinical trial already you're maybe you know this is not a, a slippery slope, but um, uh, you know so you're seeing companies or clinics file a clinical trial with clinicaltrials.gov. It's not exactly heavily policed, um, saying they're in a cl clinical trial. It's sort of one of these perpetual clinical trials, uh, you know, with no intent to uh, to ever proceed uh, beyond beyond that. But it's used as a thinly veiled marketing sort of ploy to pretend that you're, you know, on a legitimate pathway. Um, but it's not uh, it's not necessarily even cleared. Um, so we're seeing some of that. Um, we're also seeing, um, you know, some clinics uh, passing it through an IRB, um, you know, and then saying that it's a clinical trial that's been approved by IRB. So a lot of that is marketing smoke and mirrors in some instances. Um, you know, the other phenomena that we're seeing, and again, you know, this isn't even going to the point of, you know, possibly this, uh, these trials doing harm, but, you know, um, I I've run across uh, physicians, for instance, who are having problems recruiting patients. You know, um, I know. Uh, you know, I've heard. Uh, I've heard cardiovascular physicians in 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 Florida, for instance, say, uh, it, you know, there's they they have trouble recruiting patients for their AMI trials or or chronic heart failure trials because I can go to University of Miami and and you know enroll in a trial and I've got a 50% chance of being in a placebo, or I can go you know 20 minutes across to one of the islands and pay 15,000 for a guaranteed procedure, stem cells or stem 
stem cells, you know, we don't understand the distinctions and they've got a big fancy marketing website and I'm going to buy myself a guaranteed treatment as opposed to risk a placebo. You know, you're doing placebo, you know, they've got uh, osteoarthritis in both knees. Um, I want to play golf. I don't want to subject myself to only having one good knee. I want to go down the street and, and pay eight grand and get both knees treated. Um, I don't know if you've run into that, but you know that's that's and that's even before we get into you know what if what if one of these trials actually does some harm. Now you know the nice thing is, you know so far I don't know if there's some wood to knock on, but you know um, it, you know these 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 products have have been you know relatively safe so far. But this is the risk. You know you start manipulating products and you don't know what you're getting, what you're going to introduce to it. One example um, that I'd like to give is uh, the field of PRP, which I think to some extent has gone through uh, that very same process. And you, you, know, you demonstrated that in, in your talk, which is to say that there have been several trials uh, in the PRP arena that uh, came out very early on that we feel were poorly designed. Uh, and failed to show an effect of platelet-rich plasma for treatment of uh, certain uh, tendon problems. And that was all that was needed for the insurance companies to seize upon uh, the denial of those processes. So uh, for a lot of uh, payers, uh, platelet-rich plasma injection therapies are, are dead in the water and they'll stand behind one uh, significant trial for uh, Achilles tendinopathy that was not well designed and, uh, and then uh, that treatment is no more except for a, a cash paying business. And, you know, uh, I think that goes to your point is that we don't really want to have this niche uh, treatment that is only available to the, to, the, to the wealthy down in South Florida who can afford to uh, pay $5,000 for a treatment. If we have, uh, you know, a chronic non-healing condition that could benefit from a, from a medical procedure, a surgical procedure, we want to be able to offer it to people and people have insurance and they want their insurance companies to pay for it. So, uh, so yes, I think, we're, uh, I think it's a, a jeopardy when you have poorly controlled trials or if you have practitioners who are just using it off the cuff that it, it may one day spoil the well, so to speak. I would just like to add that um, one of the things to keep in mind is that much of the product development that goes on in this area is iterative. Some of the adverse events that occur in early studies, um, things where the scaffold might not be poorly, uh, might, not, might, might not be fully characterized. When, when Tony Atala spoke this morning about putting together a team that looks at every stage and, and make sure that you have just the right matrix and just the right stimulation and just the right growth conditions to get just the right product for that particular disease, you have to do that iteratively over and over again. There's always going to be the risk that people are going to develop shortcuts, people are going to take uh, short steps, they're going to look at different ways, maybe inside the United States, outside the United States, through the practice of medicine, whatever. That, that risk is always going to exist, and can it poison the well for the people that are compliant in developing this? Absolutely it can, but I think that good science and people who are dedicated to doing things the right way in a compliant way ultimately win out. Uh, and this is an area in a field right now with stem cells where there is so much misinformation. It's like gen direct to consumer genetic testing. I can go down the street and pay $10,000 and get my genome and it's completely meaningless. And, and I could go across the street and get it done by someone else and it could be something completely different. And it's the exact same genome. Why? Because there's so much misinformation out there. I is this field going to suffer from that? Unfortunately, I think the answer is probably yes to some extent. And yet, you know, the flip side, and I'm sorry, I'll get to your question in a minute. The, the, the flip side is, as you've pointed out, Shane, there's a long tradition, uh, you know, I think around the world, especially in this country, of surgical innovation. And I think, you know, the, the one credible argument that, that I've heard from Chris Centeno and others is that, you know, the fear that this, you know, quote, overregulation is really suppressing the kind of surgical, in, in, uh, you know, innovation that, 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 that medicine has relied on and, and really benefited from over the course of the last number of decades. Uh, this is a question for Randy. Could you give a simplified um, overview of what the draft in October is how it's different from Well, sure. Um, it has to do with um, same surgical procedures. Um, there's always been a theory that if you take something out of a patient and put it right back into the patient, that FDA doesn't regulate that. So patient goes into the hospital, you take the blood out of them, you run it through an, an apheresis d device, you pull out the, the toxins you don't want, or a, uh, not even an apheresis device. Um, 
uh, dialysis machine. You pull off what you don't want, you put back in the good stuff. FDA doesn't regulate that. That's clearly the practice of medicine. And, and FDA also defined within the tissue regulations at 21 CFR 1271, part 1271, that HTTPs did not include cells processed in a single center not stored, not shipped, and used in the practice of medicine in the same surgical procedure. So by definition, you're excluded from regulation. You're not even within that small regulatory, minimal regulatory category if you're truly used in the same surgical procedure. So the October 2014 guidance document came out uh, and said, we want to get some clarity what we mean by same surgical procedure. So same surgical procedure, yes, it means in the same location. It, yes, it means on the same day. Typically, there's a little minimal storage that could be had. But what it doesn't mean is changing the cells in some drastic way, manipulating them significantly so that they do something differently, achieving some predetermined therapeutic benefit, or exposing them to conditions that could change the risk of them causing disease or leading to contamination or infection. The, under the Public Health Service Act, those are the criteria that FDA can use to regulate 361 HTTPs. You have to make sure that they don't transmit disease, to make sure they don't become contaminated, where they, could, they have to be free from filth. There's a number of things under the Public Health Service Act that they're allowed to do. One of the things they're not supposed to do is regulate whether those products are effective for their use, because that's not one of the criteria that they were given authority to regulate. So this guidance document, this October 2014 guidance document, is saying same surgical procedure doesn't just mean same surgical procedure. It means same surgical procedure and one that doesn't turn it into something new and one that doesn't create risks of infection or disease transmission. And that's pretty much what it's limited to. Is there any, is there any um, um, guidance around what, what the cells are used for? Like the, no. Like the homo no. No, none. Uh, you know, and, and I'll tell you, you know, this is this is largely in response. I mean, I, you know, I'll be very careful in, uh, you know, in identifying that the clinic, but, you know, there's a there's a West-ish, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, coast um, um, clinic um, where the clinicians, uh, you know, have stood up in very public forums uh, with a great deal of bluster and basically relied entirely on that and said, you know, as much as, look, if I can figure out how to genetically modify the cells in the same surgical procedure, I, I would do it. I can do it. I'm a doctor. I have every right to do absolutely anything I can do with those cells as long as it's the same surgical procedure. And they say it with a great deal of confidence and a great deal of, of, of like I say, bluster. And these are, you know, these are physicians, you know, taking liposuction, spinning those cells and, you know, and injecting them in, you know, the spinal cords and brains and, you know, like the, just the, 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 the wildest type of stuff. So, and, and relying exactly on that, on that exception. Did I answer your question? Um, More or less, I was. Well, that wasn't simple. That was one question. But the, uh, I guess since I've been through the, some of the meeting sessions today, it didn't it sound like just that criteria. So was there any other part of that draft that looked at use of the centrifuge or anything else that was part of the, the I think they, t they, used, they referenced centrifuges in the guidance. Mike, I don't know if you know the guidance. I, actually, I think I have it with me. Give me one second. I'm embarrassed to say I didn't bring a copy of that guidance with me, because uh, I've heard this question about the centrifugation, which was a, a kind of a nuance to me that uh, was unfamiliar, so Don Fink, FDA. So I'm happy to hear him read specifically, because I know it, part of the question, they did list some examples of what constituted more than minimal manipulation within the guidance. And when I saw that, I just sort of bleeped over it, because I already know what minimal manipulation is, and so I didn't read it with the, maybe the care that needed to be read. So. Right. Okay. But it's not about minimal manipulation per se, is it? It's, 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 it's about whether you're doing things which have, which present the opportunity to, um, to, 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 to present con potential contamination, or is that one and the same, really? Such, such HTTP, which is everything. I mean, everything's an HTTP. So it just to be defined in tissue base. Back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
not. Right. No, no, I, I, okay. but there are all kinds of examples listed, or not all kinds, there's some examples listed in the document about what we mean did not affect such ATP so as to trigger a greater regulatory oversight within what people have considered the same surgical procedure. And what you said is exactly the type, I believe, the type of, of circumstance we're trying to narrow down, which is using it as a free-for-all within the same, within the operating room to do whatever it is you feel you would like to do, but you're doing it under the same surgical procedure. So well, I think we're clarifying or narrowing I, that window. I, I think this is an interesting issue because it creates tension between a guidance document and the preamble to the original regulation. In, in the sense here that this is what it says, as a general matter, as a general matter, the establishment may qualify for the exception if the only processing steps taken are rinsing, cleansing, or sizing the tissue. Now, the preamble to the GTP regulations says that minimal manipulation and processing that does not alter the relevant characteristics of a tissue can include anything including cutting, grinding, shaping, uh, demineralization itself certainly changes some characteristics but not the relevant characteristics of bone. And FDA in the preamble to a regulation which carries more weight than a guidance document says that those types of processes are not more than minimal, minimal manipulation. So the guidance document, I, didn't, I don't see a section where it specifically calls out centrifugation. But the question would always be, is that centrifugation step one that alters the relevant characteristics of the cells that you're processing? And if your argument is that you can show that it doesn't alter those relevant characteristics, I think you could argue that it's not processing that goes beyond what's necessary or appropriate in a single surgical procedure. But it is going to depend on the specific facts. And it also depends, as we, just, as we discussed before, whether the FDA is going to apply this reverse onus on you, right? That, that basically we're going to infer that you've changed the physical properties of the cells until you've proven that you have not, right? Which is, you know, a, a, a difficult onus as well, but one that we've seen precedent for. <laughs> Good. Sorry. I, I, I felt like there was something hanging there, and I didn't want to leave it hanging. No, thank you. Okay, no problem. We are now well over time, which means we've had an exciting debate. So that's uh, that's very good. So thank you, uh, thank you all for your participation.